Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandian. Today we're going to take a look at the communion table and understand the difference between a carnal Christian and an unbeliever. An unbeliever cannot partake of communion, but a carnal believer can if he'll confess his sins. Jesus introduced the communion table the night that Judas betrayed him. So we're going to talk about the carnal Christian. We're going to talk about the unbeliever. You're going to be blessed today to understand it. Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Great to have you here today. If you want to open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to talk today about the difference between a sinner and a carnal Christian. We're going to compare two people, Judas and Peter, in this to really find out the difference between the two. And so while you're fighting 1 Corinthians chapter 11, let me just thank you again for joining me. And for those of you joining me for the first time, I welcome you. Glad to have you here today. For those of you that are back for the fourth, fifth, tenth time, well, thank you for being such a glutton for punishment. Thank you for being big back. But for those that really have been following me for years, Man, thank you so much. They've been partners with me for years. So faithful to give. I'll tell you what, I couldn't do what I do. Literally, what you're giving into this ministry for is not just equipment, all those things. Listen, those equipment are just like, you know, just like the finances themselves. They're used and they're used to help bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ, number one. But number two, which is the greatest part of my calling to make disciples out of converts. And so God doesn't want us just to be converts. He wants us to become disciples. If all God wanted was a convert, just getting somebody saved, he'd yank you out of here the moment you got saved. He had arrived, but that's not what it's for. He wants us to walk like Jesus in this earth, to literally become Christians, little Jesuses, that from the outside, we walk, talk, and act just like Jesus Christ did. We have the same calling on our life, the same fervor to win souls, but also the same fervor to bring people into discipleship ourselves. The reason why he left us here is this. Converts go to heaven, but disciples take other people with them. And this is what God is wanting to happen in this earth. Not just one person to get saved and be removed from here, but for that one person to literally become a disciple. And through his ministry, hundreds come to know Jesus. That's what Satan hates. He doesn't want you to get saved. I mean, honestly, Satan hates it when you get saved, but he despises it even more when you become a disciple. So he'll try to keep you from getting saved, but once you do get saved, he'll try to get you into every kind of diversion possible so that you don't grow up and simply tell you, you don't need to grow up. I mean, you're saved, just sit back, relax, you're going your way to heaven. All I'm saying is, no, that's not why God left you here. He left you here to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to those people that just believed in him in John 8, now, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Well, I thought I was free when I got saved. Yes, you are inside, but he wants you to walk in a freedom daily, freedom of your thoughts, freedom from mental oppression, freedom from fear, all those different things. And that comes by knowledge of the word of God. Notice the truth doesn't make you free. Knowing the truth makes you free. So if you'd like to become a partner with me, I'd love to have you do so. You're joining in with a group of people that love to see people grow up, love to see stability come into lives. And that's what my calling in life is, my ultimate calling, the truth of what God's called me to as a teacher of the word of God. I pastored for 33 years, but I was a pastor teacher. I opened up the word then just like I'm opening it up now. And I had a great time. We literally, hundreds of ministers left our church to go and start churches, missions, works, uh, organizations around the world. And I can't wait to get to heaven because this will be a whole lot of people I'm going to meet when I get there. So if you'd like to become a partner with me, go to my website, bobyandian.com, and you'll find a place there to become a partner. I want to thank you ahead of time. Thank you for committing yourself to me and to this ministry. And above all, thank you for committing yourself into this great call to help raise up disciples, to help raise up mature believers in the word of God in this earth. So again, bobbyandian.com, I'll be glad to hear from you. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, take a look with me at verse 23, then we're gonna jump down to verse 27 through 31. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this chapter deals with mainly toward the end of it with the communion table and how the uh, how the Corinthians themselves had abused the communion table, how they had turned it into a time of perversion. There was a partying going on. It ended up in, in sexual activity. I mean, this thing was nothing but just an orgy, which started with a meal, which was literally the communion table, which Paul said, this is wrong, and literally told them what the meal was for, not just a general meal for people to come in and eat and then turn into a wine 
while party. No, in verse 23, it says, for I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. He points out very quickly that the communion uh, that started that night started with the fact that that was the night that Jesus was also betrayed by Judas. Judas is part of the 12 came in. He was only part of the 12 numerically. He was not part of the 12 as far as being born again. From the very beginning, he rejected the Lord. Jesus knew he had rejected the Lord, but simply wants us to understand if it happened in Jesus' ministry, it can happen in ours. There are going to be people that come in the church that profess to be saved, but are not, and literally will even argue with the Lord on that day. Didn't we cast out devils in your name? And didn't we do great wonders in your name? He'll say, no, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Uh, there's people taking that verse, but how could, how could they cast out devils and how could they do signs and wonders in the name of Jesus and not be saved? Because that's works. All they talked about was their works. They did not say, didn't we put our full faith and trust in you, accept you as our Savior and accept you as our Lord? That would not even have been a question about their salvation. They would have been saved, but all they did was fall back on their works. There were seven sons of Sceva that did the same thing and cast out devils, but they were not children of God. They were actually followers and children of Satan himself. They gave forth lying signs and wonders. It's possible for a person to come in church and fool people, and we think they're saved, but God really knows their heart. This is the way it was with Judas. Judas looked like a disciple, talked like a disciple, acted like a disciple, but was filled with good works. He loved to take the money that was in there and give it to the poor while he took some from himself. In fact, there was so much money in that pot, even the disciples didn't miss it. Only the Lord knew he was stealing from that. But this is the same night that finally he was exposed in front of the other 11, took the money bag, ran out the door. And the moment that he did, most disciples looked at each other and said, well, I guess he's gone to give money to the poor. It happened so often they didn't think a thing about it, but he was literally stealing the money bag, running out the door and didn't come back. And Jesus just basically said, basically let him have it. All right. But he had had to leave the room for a reason. We're going to find this out in verse 27. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, not discerning the Lord's body, many are weak and sick among you, many sleep. That's die early. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. This, These verses 27 through 31 are not directed to sinners. They're directed to Christians. And in the beginning, let's go back to the uh, time when Jesus was offering that meal. In there, we had 11 believers believers and one unbeliever. And Jesus even said he was a devil from the beginning. And so he never did accept Jesus, but acted like it. And in fact, fooled the rest of the disciples, but not Jesus. But anyway, he ran from the room that night and all that was left in there were the 11 disciples and some were carnal, including Peter. And that's why Jesus talked to him. And that's why Peter even felt bad about it, about what was going on. But what happened was now, now he addresses in this verse of scripture to the most carnal congregation of the New Testament. Are they believers? Yes. Had they accepted Jesus as their savior? Yes. Are they disciples? No. They have not gone beyond the new birth into the walk of a disciple following Jesus and becoming a follower of Jesus and in so doing display godliness in their life. They just kept living in sin and simply saying, we're born again, we're born again. And he was pointing out the fact God didn't save you so that you could act like this. Not only does God save you from sin, he wants to save you from sinning. He wants to turn your life around to where the world recognizes you're a Christian, and that takes time. So this congregation was the most carnal of any in the in the New Testament. Are they believers? Yes. If they died, would they go to heaven? Yes. But all types of sin were found in the church, but they'd done one thing. They had squeaked through the door of the new birth. And he simply says here in this verse of scripture, when you go to partake of communion, you can't partake of it as a carnal believer. If you do, you're going to reap back things in your life that aren't good. You're going to get sick when, this, the, when the communion elements are designed to show you healing. It's possible 
possible to get healed while you're having communion. I used to do that. As a pastor, I'd hand out the elements and then tell the congregation, when you come to that piece of bread, I said, do this. Once you eat that piece of bread, see it as the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not really the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ. It represents it. And that thing, when you put it in your mouth, see that you have partaken of the broken body of Jesus and by his stripes, which was in his body, you're healed. Receive your healing when you do that of the cup. You've already been born again. When you receive the cup, thank him for the new birth. Those elements remind you of what Jesus did for you on the cross. And one of them has the power to keep working in your life. And that is the uh, broken body. That is the bread and actually bring healing into your life. And that's why he pointed out for this reason, not discerning the Lord's body, you're weak and sick among you. If you partake of the communion elements, not understanding what that piece of of cracker is or that piece of bread is, it represents the body of Jesus, his blood, that is the cup, that is the wine, that is the grape juice that's in there. That represents the fact that you're saved, but the bread represents the fact that you're healed. And he says, you're not discerning the Lord's body. And for that reason, not discerning the Lord's body, you're weak and sick, and many of you actually die early. If you would judge yourself, you would not be judged. This is never talked to the world. The world is not to judge themselves. They judge Jesus on the cross and accept him as Savior. But once you have received him as Savior, you need to judge yourself. Is there sin in your life? Ask God to forgive you. He's simply saying this to believers. When the communion elements are passed, judge yourself first. Are you in fellowship with God or out of fellowship with God? Is there unconfessed sin in your life? Then confess them quickly. In a cup of three words, you can say, Father, I have sinned. Boom, that's it. You're forgiven of them. And if you'll judge yourself here, you will not be judged when you get to heaven. So we don't just live on this earth to prepare us for heaven. We're as much ready for heaven right now as we were 50 years ago when we got saved or 40 years or 30 or whatever. You are as much prepared for heaven now as you were then and as much prepared for heaven then as you are now. You don't grow in your preparedness to go to heaven. That's an instantaneous once and for all gift that's given to you. So the communion table is where God meets us for sanctification, not for salvation. That's why the communion table doesn't save a person. It can heal a Christian, but it doesn't save a sinner. It's called the Lord's table, not the Savior's table. What am I saying? When you partake of communion, you're partaking as a Christian. An unbeliever cannot partake of the table. In fact, God warns us, don't let unbelievers partake of this. This is something for believers. Water baptism and also communion are something that only believers can enter into. We don't baptize a sinner. We get him saved and then we baptize him. That shows he has been saved, but when he comes out of the water, now he's ready to walk off in newness of life. I have been crucified with Christ. I died with him. I was buried with him. I have been risen from the dead with him, and now I'm walking off into newness of life. It is a display to those around you that I already have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. But the communion elements are showing you that you've been saved, and the communion elements are literally, again, they are an open invitation to walk in your salvation into sanctification and into a lifestyle of holiness before the Lord, discipleship. When we come back from the break, we'll continue right there on with this teaching on communion. What is it that makes a Christian a carnal Christian? A carnal Christian is simply a Christian who is caught up in sinning. This series by Pastor Bob Yandin will help you identify the differences between carnality and spirituality and make any corrections needed to avoid carnality. The story of David's sin with Bathsheba and the results of that sin perfectly exemplify what happens when a believer chooses to walk in carnality. But thankfully, you will also learn about the process of complete forgiveness and restoration that results from repentance. This eight lesson series is a must for everyone desiring to avoid the pitfalls of carnality to walk in maturity and holiness in Christ Jesus. To order Understanding the Carnal Christian, go to bobbyendian.com. Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often become disguised as complicated or deep-sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Using straightforward vocabulary and down-to-earth examples, Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. 
Eight crucial doctrines of the Christian faith are demystified. Redemption, justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, propitiation, and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. I said it before the break, I'm saying it now again. The communion table is not called the Savior's table, it's called the Lord's table because it's given to believers only. An unbeliever is the only one who cannot partake of the communion table. There's many churches that have closed communion. What I mean by that is only if you're a member of that church can you partake of it. Folks, it's open to the members of the church, not to just that local church. Anyone that is born again can partake of communion and the Lord is letting us know that. Now, if I'm in a church and I'm speaking there and it's only a closed communion, then fine, I won't partake of it, but I know I'm saved. But every church I go to, just about say 99% of the churches I go to believe that this table is open for everybody that is saved. And the only one that can't partake of it is an unbeliever. But I'll tell you what, if you get saved before the communion begins, you can partake of it too. And so the communion table, again, is really not a focus on the fact that we've been uh, that we've been saved. It's now are focusing on the fact that I need to begin to walk in newness of life. I begin to walk in discipleship. And so again, those that watch this program, those who follow my ministry, probably 99% of you are born again and you're in different phases of areas of growth in your life. And so and through that, you begin to accept more responsibility. Now you find yourself wanting to witness more. The life that you have, you wanna share with other people. And to be honest with you, right now is one of the greatest times to witness I have ever seen. I mean, there is so much confusion, so much fear in the entire world. Even sinners know something's wrong. We who know the word of God know what's coming. We're looking for the rapture of the church. And in the midst of all this, we can do what Jesus said, Matthew 24, don't fear. I mean, with all the stuff going around, don't you dare fear. Look up, your redemption draws nigh. Walk in happiness, walk in joy, walk in faith for what's about to come. But in the meantime, get people saved. Because I can tell you this, there's carnal Christians out there or probably ignorant Christians who are fearful, but there's also a world out there. And even if they're liberal, even if they don't believe, you know, in the lifestyle of a conservative person or especially a Christian conservative, they know one thing. I wasn't bargaining for all this stuff going on. I don't even understand what's going on. They don't understand because there's an agenda in this world that's far beyond them that's been there for a long, long time and it's being run by Satan. And so right now we can look at all this because you know what? I know what Satan's up to, but I also know what God's up to. As it says in the first, in the second Psalm, he that sits in the heavens will laugh at them. When they talk about we're going to take over the earth. We're going to stop the, the church. We're going to break their chains that slow us down. God's in the heaven laughing at them, even deriding them, it says there in, in Psalm 2. I think he's just punching Jesus next to him and in derision, making fun of what the world is saying. But then he goes on to say after that, he's going to turn and his anger and his wrath is going to come out. And through that, we have Jesus is coming back for his church. And then after that, the tribulation will occur on this earth. But after that, Jesus is gonna come back and rule on this earth for a thousand years. All I can tell you is why should we be fearful? And why should we be despondent? Why should be we be let down? We should be rejoicing. And on top of that, this is a great time to witness. The world knows something's going on. So when you're with people, just start to mention the fact, that what's going on in the world? Boy, I'm sure glad I know the Bible. They'll be, listen, they'll be jumping in wanting to know, well, what does the Bible say? They may never have been interested in the Bible but suddenly now they are. And so again, that's what my ministry is dedicated to. And I want to thank you guys again for simply becoming partners with me and joining in with me. Again, if you'd like to become a partner, I'd love to have you as a partner. And again, hold hands with me, hold hearts with me, and let's get this uh, people out there saved and especially move them into discipleship, strong Christians for the Lord. So the Lord's table, 
That's what we call it, not the Savior's table. Communion doesn't save a person. The elements show the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and from that time, we're now walking in the things of God. It's a place that we do it, if we do it weekly or if we do it monthly. Jesus didn't say how often. He said just as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. It's a place to refocus our attention on the Lord and remember the results of the cross for power to live the Christian life under the Lordship of Jesus. The cup shows the work of the blood after salvation is to be taken in sanctification for a walk with Jesus. It's to be taken in sanctification and for sanctification. It's to be taken by a person in fellowship with God to help, help us maintain a walk of being in fellowship with God. It is a moment for confession of sins before taking the elements. That's why it says here, let a man examine himself and then let him eat. That's in verse 28. If we would judge ourselves, that's down here on earth, we would not be judged. And that's the judgment seat of Christ. And that's in verse 31. The bread shows the work of the body of Jesus in our daily life for this cause, not discerning the Lord's body correctly. We don't understand what that piece of bread is all about. Many are weak and sickly among you, and many of you sleep or die early. That's found in verse 30. So it simply comes back to this. Sinners are different than carnal Christians, how God looks at the two. Sinners don't have Jesus living in them. They don't have the presence of the Holy Spirit living in them. They have not been recreated by the Holy Spirit. They are not born again. But a carnal Christian is born again, but he's living like the world. He's under the control of his flesh, not under the control of his spirit, who is indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Carnal believers were taking communion in Corinth. What this verse is saying is the two that should not be partaking of communion is number one, a sinner, but number two, a carnal believer. But a carnal believer can snap back into it and partake of it. An unbeliever has to go through the motions of accepting Jesus, having him as a Lord and Savior, then understanding the work of the communion elements. A carnal Christian may understand the table, may understand what the elements represent, but doesn't care to get back in fellowship with God. And this is what was happening with the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and 3. Paul said to them, I, brethren, could not speak to you as unto spiritual people, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Notice this, they're carnal, but they're still in Christ. They're called carnal Christians. With many people, it's almost like a contradictory term. How can I be a Christian and be carnal? The world is filled with carnal Christians. The Bible is filled with carnal Christians. In fact, most of the heroes of the Old Testament went through periods of carnality themselves, and that's brought out in Hebrews chapter 11. And then in chapter 12, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Because why? It's comparing us to those who were back there in chapter 11, the heroes of faith through the Old Testament. They're still heroes of faith, even though at for a time and some for longer periods of time than others were carnal, walking under the control of their flesh. Ephesians chapter five and verse 14. Therefore he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead. The Greek actually says this, arise from among the dead and Christ will give you light. So what he's saying here in Ephesians 5, 14 is what he said already in 1 Corinthians chapter three, verses one and three, there are carnal Christians among you. Here was a church in Corinth that was mainly carnal Christians. In Ephesus, it was mainly spiritual Christians, but there were some who were carnal. That's why he said, you are asleep among the dead. In other words, a sinner is dead, but a carnal Christian is sleeping among the dead. How do you tell if a person is asleep among a hundred dead people? You have to check real close for signs of life because from every way you look at him, he looks like a dead person. He's really alive, but he's sleeping among the dead. That tells us some things about carnal Christians. They mainly hang around the world. And when they, even they're around us, what they're saying basically is a lie. But when they're around the world, they feel much more comfortable. And that's because they're being controlled by their flesh. What God wants you to do is repent. And this is what happens with communion comes. He said, if you don't repent as a Christian, when the communion elements are bringing around, you'll get yourself sick. You might even die early. But if you discern the proper elements and you discern them properly and you then get back in fellowship with God, they bring great blessing into your life. At any moment, a believer is either spiritual or carnal, controlled by the Holy Spirit or controlled by his flesh. Literally, to be carnally 
that's your flesh, fleshly minded brings about death. In other words, the things that you do will not last. They'll just, they'll have them for a while and they'll fall apart. Does it bring around spiritual death for you and you'll go to hell? That's not what it's saying. Carnal Christians will be in heaven before the judgment seat of Christ. And there, all their works may be nothing but wood, hay, and stubble. Okay, God wants you to have a lot of gold, silver, and precious stones when you come. Things that you did out of the control of the spirit, not by the control of the flesh. If your flesh controls you, you might be doing exactly the same thing you would be doing as a spiritual Christian. You might be giving an offering, but it doesn't count with God. Sinners can give offerings to God and it doesn't count with God. So it is with a carnal Christian. A Christian who's under the control of the flesh may try to give the largest offering in church and impress people, but it really doesn't matter. Ananias and Sapphira tried that, died in church. Did they go to heaven? Yes, but they were carnal believers. A carnal believer can partake if they confess their sins first, but an unbeliever cannot take communion at all. And that's why, again, that and water baptism are so close to each other. It's something that a believer can do. In fact, water baptism is something a believer can do immediately after receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The moment that a sinner, such as, as the Ethiopian eunuch, the moment that he received Jesus, he said to Philip, there's water. What does hinder me from being baptized? And he was baptized immediately. And we find this throughout the time of the New Testament. But communion can come later. And you understand this one lasts all through my lifetime. You're baptized in water once. But then after that, communion is something whenever you take it, it always brings you back to what Jesus did for you on the cross. And again, the Lord's table, it is your step into discipleship in the Christian life. Understanding that discipleship is impossible if I'm out of fellowship with God. Discipleship is is impossible if I am a carnal believer. So like water baptism, the communion table is only for believers, not for un unbelievers. Neither water baptism nor communion can save you. Both show holiness for believers, not salvation for sinners. How important is that? It's so simple. Spiritual believers are commanded to eat and to drink, but carnal believers are commanded to examine their own heart first and if needed, repent and then eat and drink. Sinners are not to eat of the communion table at all. So again, we come back to it when, when Jesus that night introduced it in the presence of those disciples, there was a few carnal believers, but there was one unbeliever. And Jesus pointing this out, was talking to Peter, but also talking to and about Judas. And Peter represents a carnal believer. Was he allowed to have communion? Yes, but he had to get himself right first. And Judas, Judas could not have communion at all. In fact, after he betrayed the Lord, he ran from the room. And then we have Jesus presenting the communion elements. Again, a type of this. And what the Lord wants us to understand is this, is that when a person receives Jesus as Lord and Savior, they're not saved by communion. Communion shows that they have been saved. And they understand now that these elements represent, now that I'm born again, I'm going to increase in my Christian life by properly understanding the work of the blood of Jesus Christ and also understanding the work of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, that by his stripes I was healed. When we come back tomorrow, we're going to continue this as we talk about again Judas and Peter, but also talk about the unbeliever and the carnal Christian. I know you're going to be impressed. I know you're going to be blessed by this, and we'll see you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Visit bobyandian.com. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.